We want to welcome you this morning to the house of the Lord. We're very glad that you're here. If you're visiting with us today, we welcome you. And we say a special hello to everybody who's watching online this morning. However you're here, we're very glad that you're here. Just uh, one, one announcement. I'm having some connection problems with my phone and the camera. Just wondering if you're here, if you have your Wi-Fi on on your phone, if you wouldn't mind maybe switching it off for today. And uh, we can make sure that we give as much power as we can uh, for the live stream. All right. This, uh, this coming week is Remembrance Day, and so we want to do something to commemorate that. So I'm going to ask that you stand this morning, and we're going to sing our national anthem. to know um, evangelist Jack West. Anybody ever hear of him? Fantastic preacher, man of God, and he became a, a very a dear friend to me. We lived in the same area. And uh, years ago, he he wrote a little poem, and I want to read that uh, this morning. It says, I wear a poppy red today, and silent bowed my head to pray. When far from the land uh, when from the far land of memory there marched a long, thin line. Their faces grimed with battle smoke, their shoulders sagging, sagging neath a pack, comrades in arms who came not back, and so I wear a poppy red. Theirs was a badge of wounds that bled. Theirs a white cross where poppies wave on silent grass-grown far-off grave. My poppy cost a silver coin. A hasty moment fastened it, so all could see I'd done my bit. Their red badge cost, oh yes, how much it cost. I owe much more, much more, than what I gave that woman in the rain for poppy red. I must so live that they shall not have died in vain. Can we bow our heads for a moment of silence, please? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we have to come together today, for this opportunity that we have to freely worship you. We realize, Lord, that this came through the sacrifice of your Son, Jesus Christ, but we also realize that it came through the sacrifice of brave men and women who fought for our freedom. We honor their memories today. We honor those who are still living. We will never forget them. Father, I pray a blessing on them and on their families today. Lord, I pray that your spirit would be here with us in a very strong and mighty way today. 
and give you praise, honor, and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. says that someday he's coming back again. Praise yeah. the Lord. Hallelujah. So we look forward to that day. If you have some uh, family members close by, why don't you get a hug? If you have some neighbors close by, a little elbow bump.
said, no greater love as any man than this, that he would lay down his life for his friends. Yeah. And Jesus died for so many reasons, but he died so that we can be called friends of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you. 
salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Hallelujah. Let's just lift our hands towards heaven this morning and give him praise and glory and honor. Hallelujah. of this life because Jesus saved us and he set us free and this world is not our home we're passing through our citizenship is in heaven
church just keep pressing in this morning he needs to hear our praise the Bible says the Lord inhabits the praises of his people let's lift it up this morning praise and honor and glory Thank you for your mighty presence, yes. the presence of your spirit that we feel in this place today. And we give you praise and honor and glory. Father, I pray that our hearts are prepared this morning for your word. Yes, Lord. You can speak to us, Lord. And I ask that your anointing rest on me as I bring it forth. Lord, we just pray for a special touch on everybody, Lord, that needs a healing today. We think of our brother Johnny O. God, that you would just touch him and heal yes, him Lord. from the moment, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. We pray for our brother, Pastor Billy, God, with yes, his Lord. struggles with skin cancer, Lord. We oh, just pray for you. Yes, In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Father, so many need a healing touch. Yes, now, Father, we all need a fresh filling. Yes. Pour it out on us, Lord God. And fill us to overflowing. Jesus. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Please uh, turn your attention to the screen for the announcements this morning. says that out of the mouths of babes comes perfected praise. Hallelujah. And uh, we just want to speak a blessing over them. Kids Church this morning, 
We also want to speak a, a blessing over all the, of the other churches in town that are proclaiming oh, yes. the word of God today, that God will bless them and that God will bless us here. Just uh, one more announcement before we look into the word, just regarding uh, uh, our time of uh, coffee and cookies after the service. We have extended the area into the sanctuary as well to allow for uh, physical distancing while these restrictions are in place. And uh, we just want to pray that uh, God would would uh, just continue to work and, and eradicate this virus from the earth. Yes. We've been told uh, by our premier that uh, all restrictions may lift by the end of March. So we're, we're hoping if that happens, we're going to take an extended time during our Sunday morning service so that you all can catch up on some hugs. Yeah. Amen. All right? Yeah. So, but after service, please uh, get coffee and cookies. Please feel free to come in here and uh, fellowship in here. And uh, I'm not too worried about crumbs and such. I don't ever spill coffee on the floor. I have a little shelf here that catches everything. So. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, if you have your Bible with you, I'm going to invite you please to turn to Daniel chapter 4. Daniel chapter 4. This is a great passage of scripture very strange passage and we're going to dig into it today and hopefully pull some points of application out that we can use for our lives in his uh, fantastic book mere christianity c.s lewis calls it the great sin he writes there is one vice of which no man in the world is free which everyone in the world loathes when he sees it in someone else, and of which hardly any people except Christians ever imagine that they are guilty themselves. There's no fault which makes a man more unpopular and no fault which we are more unconscious of in ourselves. And the more we have it ourselves, the more we dislike it in others. C.S. Lewis in that little statement is talking about the sin of pride. In Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 to 19, we, we find a very interesting list. It's a list of things that God hates. If you find a list like that in the Bible, you need to pay attention to it, okay? He says, there are six things the Lord hates. There are seven things he cannot stand. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that kill innocent people, a mind that thinks up evil plans, feet that are quick to do evil, a witness who tells lies, and a man who causes trouble among brothers. Those are the seven things that God hates. And did you notice which one is on the very top of the list? It says a proud look. Some translations say haughty eyes, but it's the sin of pride. Now, what is pride? It, pride is, uh, it, it is an exaggerated and dishonest self-evaluation. It's when we want people to believe something about us, even though we know it isn't true or is at best an overinflated, uh, self-perceived virtue. Pride seeks value, honor, importance, reputation, and significance that isn't deserved. I like what David Jeremiah says, pride is an ego-motivated maneuver to hide from ourselves and others the truth about our inner reality. And all through the whole Bible, it talks about the folly of pride. King Nebuchadnezzar was a very proud man. His sin wasn't in knowing that he was talented. His problem was that he considered himself the source of his talent. And he wanted the whole world to acknowledge his abilities and he did not give any credit whatsoever to the thousands of talented laborers and craftsmen who actually built the city of Babylon. And he gave absolutely zero credit to the Lord God. 
I want to submit to you this morning that it is possible to be talented and gifted and humble all at the same time. We only need to look to Jesus to see evidence of that. We commit the sin of pride when we refuse to acknowledge that all good gifts come from God alone. The sin of pride, it leads us to brag and to flaunt and to self-promote to such a degree that there's nowhere left to go but down. Proverbs 11 verse 2 says, People who are proud will soon be disgraced. And it follows it up by saying it is wiser to be modest. All throughout the Bible there are passages that talk about pride, but there isn't a better example of that uh, than Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 4. And when God finished with him, Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar gives this report, the very last verse of this chapter. He says, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the king of heaven, because everything he does is right and all his ways are just, and those who walk in pride he is able to humble. Spoken by a man who went through a process of being humbled by God. Those of us who profess the name of Jesus, we have to humble ourselves all the time because if we don't, God will humble us. It's easier for us to do it because when God humbles us, it's generally not pleasant. In this passage, Nebuchadnezzar, he's in the 35th year of his reign as king. Historically, we're in the year approximately 570 BC. 33 years earlier in Daniel chapter two, the king has a dream that disturbed him. And now 33 years later, we see the king having another dream that disturbs him and he wants it interpreted. And this passage, Daniel chapter 4, is written in the first person. This is a testimony of Nebuchadnezzar himself. He wrote this account. Daniel included it in his book. But these are the words of Nebuchadnezzar. It's a first-hand account. And this passage divides neatly into three sections. I want to use that to guide us this morning. First of all, the king and his dream. The king and his dream. And I want us to notice three things about this dream. First of all, the reason for the dream. Now the first three verses of Daniel chapter four are a preface, telling us that the account we're about to read is Nebuchadnezzar's. He had gone through uh, what he went through and wrote these words after. The king declares that his testimony is universal in scope, verse one. King Nebuchadnezzar, to the peoples, nations, and men of every language who live in all the world, may you prosper greatly. A personal message from the king. It's not somebody else's story. It's Nebuchadnezzar's story. Verse 2. It's my pleasure to tell you about the miraculous signs and wonders that the Most High God has performed for me. By the way, according to the 32nd verse the events described in this chapter last for seven years. So Nebuchadnezzar wanted to take this opportunity to explain his mysterious absence from the throne that lasted for seven years. And in verse 3, he summarizes the attitude of his heart towards God. This is his attitude after the events of the chapter have transpired. Uh, and it says this, Verse 3, how great are his signs, how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an eternal kingdom. His dominion endures from generation to generation. What a statement that is by a pagan king. The, the events described in this chapter, they are events that changed him. He was a changed man. Secondly, notice the reception of the dream, the reception of the dream. Hold on while I reconnect my phone to this camera. 
Now, verse 4, Nebuchadnezzar introduces us to another strange dream. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at home in my palace, contented and prosperous. His, his military conquests were finished at this point. His coffers were full. He was very happy with all that he had accomplished. And one night he went to bed, and while he slept, he had a dream. Verse 5, I had a dream that made me afraid. As I was lying in my bed, the images and visions that passed through my mind terrified me. And when you have dreams like this, you lose sleep. They're terrible. What does Nebuchadnezzar do? Verse 6, so I commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be brought before me to interpret the dream for me. When the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, diviners came, I told them the dream, but they could not interpret it for me. So this time, instead of requiring that the counselors first tell them the dream and then interpret it, he gives, he gives them the content. He wants a quick interpretation. But the wise men failed to give Nebuchadnezzar a message that he was happy with. Even if they knew the correct interpretation, they would have been unwilling to deliver it to the king. Because nobody wants to deliver a message of doom to send to somebody who has the power to uh, have their heads lopped off. I kind of like my head right where it is. Daniel was the only one of the king's wise men who really did not live in fear of him. And so Daniel is finally summoned. Verse 8, finally Daniel came into my presence and I told him the dream. He is called Belteshazzar after the name of my God and the spirit of the holy gods is in him. Now, by the way, Nebuchadnezzar mentions that fact about Daniel three times through the text here in verse 8 and in verse 9 and a little later in verse 18. During the 30 plus years of their association, Nebuchadnezzar had come to see in Daniel the difference that is always in someone who is filled with the Spirit of God. Right. Verse 9, Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, I know that the Spirit of the holy gods is in you. No mystery is too difficult for you. Here's my dream. Interpret it for me. And then the third thing about this dream, the repetition of the dream. Nebuchadnezzar proceeds to describe the dream to Daniel in two sections. The first one involves a magnificent tree. Verse 10, these are the visions I saw while lying in my bed. I looked and there before me stood a tree in the middle of the land. Its height was enormous. The tree grew large and strong and its top touched the sky. It was visible to the ends of the earth. Its leaves were beautiful, its fruit abundant, and on it was food for all. Under it, the beasts of the field found shelter, and the birds of the air lived in its branches from every creature. From it, every creature was fed. The king's dream, it depicts the tree, the tree in detail, and each characteristic of it has some prophetic significance. Uh, according to the details given to Daniel, it had the following characteristics. It, it was in the middle of the land. It was strategically located. It was strong. It stretched to the heavens. It was seen by the whole world. It was visible, it says, to the ends of the earth. It was incredibly productive. Its leaves were beautiful. It supplied nourishment for everybody. It sheltered the animals and it sustained the birds. And it carries significant meaning. And then the next thing that King sees in his dream is a message from heaven. Verse 13, in the visions I saw while lying in my bed, I looked, and there before me was a messenger, a holy one, coming down from heaven. He identifies the messenger as a holy one. It's an angel. Nebuchadnezzar saw this angel in tangible form, and he delivers a, cre a decree from God. Verse 14, he calls in a loud voice, cut down the tree, trim off its branches, Strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the animals flee from under it and the birds from its branches. So this tree is going to be cut down. Verse 15. But let the stump and its roots bound with iron and bronze remain in the ground, in the grass of the field. Let them be drenched with the dew of heaven. Let them live with the animals among the plants of the earth. So the stump would be wet with the dew every morning. 
And then with the shift of imagery, we it, it, it goes from the word tree to the word him. So this stump is typifying a human who would lose his reasoning and his faculties and graze in the field like an animal for a period of seven years. Verse 16, let his mind be changed from that as a, of a man. Let him be given the mind of an animal till seven times pass by for him. If you've ever read that verse and wondered what seven times meant, that's seven years. In verse 17, the angel gives the reason why this has to be. The decision is announced by messengers. The holy ones declare the verdict so that the living may know that the Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and gives them to anyone he wishes and sets over them the lowliest of men. We must never forget that. You know, a lot of times we, we complain about our governmental leaders. We have to keep it in the forefront of our thoughts that God has a purpose in placing them there. And at some point, he's going to remove them and place somebody else there. Our job is to pray for them and to trust God. Kings and queens come and go at the hand of God. No wonder Nebuchadnezzar was so anxious for the interpretation of this dream. And the king knew that Daniel was the man for the job. Verse 18, this is the dream that I, King Nebuchadnezzar, had. Now, Belteshazzar, tell me what it means, for none of the wise men in my kingdom can interpret it for me. But you can, because the spirit of the holy gods is in you. He was scared. Now, this leads to the second avenue of our uh, study this morning, the prophet and his response. Now, before the interpretation of the dream is revealed, we, we are told that Daniel was astonished for a time. Then Daniel, also called Belteshazzar, was greatly perplexed for a time, and his thoughts terrified him. And so the king said, Belteshazzar, do not let the dream or its meaning alarm you. He wasn't perplexed in the sense of not knowing the meaning of the dream. He knew what it meant, and he was perplexed because of what the dream meant to Nebuchadnezzar. Maybe over time, Daniel became fond of him. I don't know, but it alarmed him. He was reluctant to share the, inter the interpretation. C.F. Keel wrote this, as Daniel at once understood the interpretation of the dream, he was for a moment so astonished that he could not speak for terror at the thoughts which moved his soul. The amazement seized him because he wished well to the king, and yet he must now announce to him a weighty judgment from God. And even with the king's comforting words, the king said, Daniel, don't be afraid of what this dream means. Please, just tell me. Daniel was not comforted. It was a forewarning of judgment, not on the enemies of Nebuchadnezzar, but on the king himself. Verse 19, Belteshazzar answered, My lord, if only the dream applied to your enemies and its meaning to your adversaries. And then the message is delivered with a broken heart. He explains the meaning of the dream. Verse 20, The tree you saw which grew large and strong, with its top touching the sky, visible to the whole earth, with beautiful leaves and abundant fruit, providing food for all, giving shelter to the beasts of the field and having nesting places in its branches for the birds of the air. You, O king, are that tree. Remember earlier we discussed the different aspects of the tree had pr prophetic significance. So the tree in his dream is a representation of him. In the rest of verse 22, Daniel says, you have become great and strong. Your greatness has grown until it reaches the sky and your dominion extends to the distant parts of the earth. That Babylon was the biggest kingdom on earth at that time. Other parts of the world knew the power and the might of Babylon, Babylon and of King Nebuchadnezzar. The kingdom was so abundant that all the people there were fed well. The animals were safe there. And Daniel went on to explain that he would be removed from his throne and suffer a, a seven-year period of insanity until he came to the point in his life where he acknowledges that God rules over every human being. Verse 23, 
You, O king, saw a messenger, a holy one, coming down from heaven and saying, Cut down the tree and destroy it, but leave the stump bound with iron and bronze in the grass of the field while its roots remain in the ground. Let him be drenched with the dew of heaven. Let him live with the wild animals until seven times pass by for him. He was not only going to remove Nebuchadnezzar from his throne, he was going to make him insane and make him live like the animals. Why? To humble him. Because he would not humble himself and make him aware that he doesn't rule the universe. God does. Verse 24, this is the interpretation of king. This is the decree of the most, that the most high is issued against my Lord. He would live like an animal. Look at verse 25. You'll see what his life will be like for seven years. He'll be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like cattle and be drenched with the dew of heaven. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and gives them to anyone he wishes. Now, even though this prophecy of judgment is severe, it was interwoven with the mercy of God. God promises to preserve Nebuchadnezzar's life. Verse 26, the command to leave the stump of the tree with its roots means that your kingdom will be restored to you when you acknowledge that heaven rules. If only he had done that right there. The judgment was preceded with a warning. God sent his angel to warn the king. God always warns before he judges. Generally, the people ignore it. The judgment was proposed with a remedy. Verse 27. Therefore, O king, be pleased to accept my advice. Renounce your sins by doing what is right. You can hear the heart of Daniel. King, please renounce your sins by doing what is right and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed and it may be that your prosperity will continue. A couple verses later in verse 29, Nebuchadnezzar is given 12 months to repent. He has a year to think about it. So he delivers this message to the king with a broken heart. But we have to infer that Nebuchadnezzar, although the text doesn't mention it, does not repent it. And this leads to the third avenue of our discussion this morning, the Lord and his justice. The Lord and his justice. Notice some things with me. First of all, the king's pride. You know, pride is a steel trap, keeping the heart and mind sealed away from reason and wisdom. The nightmare, its interpretation, the, the pleading of Daniel Nothing was able to penetrate Nebuchadnezzar's pride. Nothing. And because of that, the judgment of God had to come. Verse 28. All this happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. Twelve months later, as the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, he said, Is, it, is not this the great Babylon I have built as the royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty? So here we are, 12 months later. King is walking on his rooftop terrace and he's, he's surveying the city of Babylon, the golden city, and he's up there and he's like, look at everything that I have done. Look at, look what I built. Look what I did. I built all of this so that my glory, the glory of this guy, can be manifested throughout the whole earth. Look at me. He just would not acknowledge the Lord Almighty. So the king's pride leads to the next thing, the king's punishment. Verse 31. The words were still on his lips. He, he was still in a state of bragging about himself and about how amazing and incredible he was. When a voice comes from heaven, this is what is decreed for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Imagine, you're, you're out on your porch and all of a sudden the, the heavens open and you hear a voice speaking right to you. 
Your royal authority has been taken from you. You will be driven away from people. You will live with wild animals. You will eat grass like cattle. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and gives them to anyone he wishes. Everything that was revealed in the interpretation of the dream now came back to him. The voice came from heaven and reminded him of everything that was about to happen. Verse 33, immediately what had been said about Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. Just like that. The Lord drove him insane. Just like that. He was driven away from people. He ate grass like cattle. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair grew like the feathers of an eagle and his nails like the claws of a bird. You, you know what it's like when you, uh, when you fail to you know, clip your fingernails regularly. Um, you can look this up by Google Images. There have been people that have been placed in uh, uh, Guinness Book of World Records for the longest fingernails. And I'll tell you, some of them have grown their fingernails for 12 or 13 years and they're this long and they're all curly. And, and uh, I'm not passing judgment on those people. You know, as I as I uh, as I say that, some of you are sitting there thinking, "Oh man, that's disgusting! How can any?" Well, <clears throat> people do will do stupid things to get into the Guinness Book of World Records. I'm thinking, John, someday about trying to go for the longest sermon. What do you think? No. no. All right, we'll move on then. So the insanity strikes him. He was driven from the palace to the fields. We don't know how. I think in, in that moment of insanity, he probably just ripped his robes off and went, went, I don't know, maybe on all fours, like a horse, to the fields. For seven years, seven years, Nebuchadnezzar existed apart from people. He ate grass. He disregarded his body until his hair and his nails grew. It, it, it says his hair looked like eagle's feathers. And his, his fingernails looked like bird's claws. Now this kind of thing, it seems like the stuff of legend or myth, but it was real. In fact, uh, it's a mental illness. It, it closely resembles a well-documented psychological phenomenon that plagues people to this day called uh, zoanthropy, a, a rare delusional disorder in which a person believes himself or herself to be an animal, manifests itself in a variety of animal-like behaviors such as walking on all fours, eating grass or other vegetation, or communicating only through animalistic means. It's possibly related to schizophrenia. It's mo it most commonly appears later in life, lasts for months or even years, and often reverses itself spontaneously. And the individual may not remember what has happened. Um, Spouses, if you hear your spouse barking at you, it just might be, no, I'm kidding. That, what I said there was true. Many historians have tried to explain away Nebuchadnezzar's madness by saying that he was possessed by a demon or some other deity. I see none of that here. The cause for his mental condition was simply this, the judgment of God, the judgment of God. And the result was the humbling of a prideful king for seven years. The one who had tempted Daniel and his friends to eat the forbidden food from the royal table now ate grass like a cow. And at the end of that seven year period, God was merciful. Verse 34, at the end of that time, I Nebuchadnezzar raised my eyes toward heaven and my sanity was restored. Just like that. The 
know, maybe he was eating grass and he looked up and went, Ooh, oh yeah, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna stop, I'm gonna stop with that. All right, Nebuchadnezzar says this. Then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified him who lives forever. What happened? Nebuchadnezzar ate some big, gigantic slices of humble pie mm -hmm. delivered by God. At the end of the seven years, the king was eating grass and he looks up to the sky and all of a sudden his sanity returns. And so we went from the king's pride to the king's punishment, finally to the king's praise. The king's praise. Okay? Verses 34 to 35, he, he gives out some words of praise. This is King Nebuchadnezzar speaking of the Lord. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? Unfortunately, the king did not humble himself when God gave him the opportunity, so God humbled him for seven years. And finally, when his senses returned, he recognized God and he put God in proper priority in his life. And in verse 36 and 37, Nebi tells of all the great things that God had done for him. And once again, God's mercy and God's grace are on display here. At the same time, my sanity was restored. My honor and splendor were re returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. My advisors and nobles sought me out. I was restored to my throne and became even greater before. Now, for many years, God had warned Nebuchadnezzar. He allowed him the privilege of witnessing Daniel's personal life and testimony for more than three decades. There came a time, however, when the era of God's patience came to an end and he sent judgment to the king. You need to realize that history is, is unfolding the way, according to God's plan. At some point, his patience is going to run out. That's right. Yes, it is. And I don't know if you remember what Sammy Davis used to sing on the Rowan and Martin's laughing. It's, Here come the judge. Here come the judge. Remember seeing a bumper sticker one time that said, Jesus is coming back, and boy, is he mad. <laughs> God's judgment uh, taught Nebuchadnezzar a lesson he needed we can see it in his final words now I Nebuchadnezzar praise and exalt and glorify the king of heaven because everything he does is right and all his ways are just and those who walk in pride he is able to humble we need to remember that when we see uh, those strutting politicians on the news, God can humble them. And someday he will. And at this point in the, in the narrative of Daniel, we say goodbye to King Nebuchadnezzar. In chapter 5, we're introduced to a new king, a guy named Belshazzar. Now I want to bring this to a close this morning. So let me say this, that no illness spreads quicker than the me disease. And in this chapter, we saw two men with uh, contrasting values. King Nebuchadnezzar was obsessed with one person himself. And Daniel was more concerned for this king than for himself. And by the end of the chapter, the proud man had been humbled. And the humble man had been exalted. We can't miss the lessons. And I think there's three of them. Very quickly, first of all, be humble in heart. Acknowledge Jesus Christ as the Lord of your affections. When he's enthroned in the center of your heart, he'll help you keep yourself in check. I remember uh, Pastor David Shepherd, when I, along with some of my colleagues, were being ordained back in 2002. He said to us, Keep the main thing the main thing. 
Keep Jesus Christ at the forefront of everything. Let Christ be first and don't think of yourself much at all. Keep the focus on him. Secondly, be humble indeed. Make a habit of being a servant. The best way to develop humility is to put others first and go out of your way to meet their needs. As Christmas approaches, one of the best ways to have joy at Christmas is to remember the word joy. Put Jesus first, others second, yourself last. And you'll have joy. And then thirdly, be humble in word. In conversation, shift the subject to the other person. Don't pat yourself on your back in front of people. In fact, I can't think of the reference. It's in Proverbs. It very succinctly says, uh, don't praise yourself. Let others do it. <laughs> Learn to listen. You know, we're given two ears and one mouth, so we should listen twice as much as we speak. Commit to pray over what others tell you. If only Nebuchadnezzar had been humble in heart and in deed and in word, he would not have contracted the mead disease and he wouldn't have had to live like a cow for seven years. I think the lesson for us today is we need to humble ourselves before the Lord. And this is not like a one-time thing or we do it once a month. I think we need to humble ourselves before the Lord all the time. How do we do that? Well, we, we say, you must increase and I must decrease. We pray. When I go out into the community, when I go to the stores, when I'm at my workplace, I want people to see Jesus in me and not me. You try to bring glory to God in everything that you do and everything that you say. When you're at work, in addition to being the hardest worker there, you need to be the happiest worker there, thanking God for the job he has provided you with and giving him praise and glory. This is your ministry to the Lord before others. You'll get to the point where you'll be smiling so much that you'll make people sick of you. <laughs> Why are you always smiling? I got the joy of the Lord in me. We have to humble ourselves before the Lord because anything else is insane. Would you please bow? The beautiful song that Ireland is playing softly and tenderly. Jesus is calling. He's calling for you and for me. He wants us to respond to his great love. The love of God calls out to us from a bruised and battered and broken and bloody Jesus who hung on the cross. Jesus is saying, come, come to me. All you who are weary and heavy laden, come to me, I'll give you rest. Those of you who are wandering around aimlessly, come to me and I'll save your soul and I'll give you direction for your life. If only we would turn to Jesus. I gave my heart to the Lord back in 1984 as a little boy. And I serve him still to this day. He is the greatest person in my life. I love Jesus Christ. And he loves me. And he loves you. Would you say yes to him today? The Bible says in Romans chapter 10 verses 9 and 10. If I confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. And I believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead. I will be saved. Have you ever done that? 
Say something like this in your heart. Dear Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. Please forgive me of my sins. I want to be a brand new person. I want to turn my back on the old way of doing things and follow you. Today I say that Jesus Christ is Lord. And I invite you to be my Lord and my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're here today, you prayed that prayer, you gave your heart to Jesus, I want you to come and see me. If you're watching online and you gave your heart to Jesus today, I'd like you to get in touch with me with that email uh, on the screen there. Take a screenshot of it and you can send me an email and I want to just be in touch with you and, and encourage you in your steps as a new believer. I want to thank you for being here today and the Lord bless you.